Hey zoologist, we're back and now we're going into chapter 7 uh, covering the phylum Nidaria. Uh, so these are the familiar things I hope to you like jellyfish, sea anemones, and maybe some things you're not as familiar with like hydra. So we're going to cover the major evolutionary innovations, the general characteristics of Nidarians overall that all of them share. We'll talk about um, a few different classes of um, Nidarians and what are their key character characteristics, and then some of the higher level concepts I'll cover in class. But one important thing to note is that we're only going to cover the Nidaria. We're not going to cover the Tinafore, so those are the comb jellies. So we're going to skip that altogether. So these are some images that show you some examples of classic Nidarians. So all kinds of jellyfish, although there's quite a bit of diversity in what could be termed a jellyfish. You have sea anemones, and you have corals, and gorgonas, and sea pens, and all kinds of interesting creatures, including um, the Portuguese man of war. So some of these characteristics I'm going to cover in a bit more detail in lecture in class. Um, but the, the major big concept that we cover at, with the Nidarians and why we cover them is that these are organisms that are a few steps beyond sponges. So they're a bit more um, organized and um, advanced is probably not the best word, but <clears throat> they have more complex systems than sponges do, and yet they're still quite simple animals. So I'll talk in more detail in class about um, some of these structures, but generally speaking what you see is that um, they now have um, organ systems, or they're beginning to have organ systems and true tissues, whereas we didn't quite see that with the sponges. And what that allows them to do is to, among other things, gather nutrients more efficiently um, and more rapidly. They're more uh, better capable of movement and moving around. Um, they can respond to their environment a bit more directly. And they have some control over their movement, but it's pretty limited. So these guys exhibit radial symmetry, and you can kind of get a sense of that right here. So they're, you, you can think of them as being circular. They're not completely circular, but they're, they're pretty much radial-like. You know, radial um, and you can divide them in any number of, of pie slices, if you will, and they're virtually um, similar in each of those pieces of the pie. Now, that's a, an advance in responding to the environment compared to what the um, sponges could do because, again, they, they generally can move and they can respond to their environment from all sides of their body. So they have some sensory organs that allow them to respond to their environment all the way around them. And they have sensory organs uh, that the sponges lacked. One possible drawback, though, is that while they can move a bit more adeptly than sponges can, um, and they can respond to their environment. Um, they don't have cephalization, so these guys have no head, and they don't have very um, specialized sensory systems, and so they are limited in how they can respond. This will become clearer when I talk about the nervous system and the epitheliomuscular cells. But yes, they can move, and they can move in their environment, but it's limited. They can respond to the environment, but not in a completely directed way. Uh, do recall that these guys um, do develop from two germ cell layers, so from the ectoderm and the endoderm, so they are diploblastic. And the hallmark feature that gives this phylum its name is that they possess nidocytes. Um, so the C is silent, so nidocytes. And I say here that nematocytes are one type of nidocytes, but that's not quite the way that works. Let me show you in more detail. So nidocytes are structures that are, they could loosely be referred to as stinging cells, and they use these for prey capture and for defense. So nidarians can have these nidocytes anywhere on their bodies. They can have them on their, the, the solid part of their bodies. They can have them on the tentacles, just about anywhere. Um, and actually, if we zoom in, this is an example of a hydra. You're going to see some hydra in lab. If we zoom in on their bodies, um, and this is a cross-section of what that looks like. And the nidocytes are here. And if we zoom in on the nidocytes, here is a rough sketch of how they appear. Now, I find it quite annoying that some of these terms, uh, some of the structures on the nidocytes, continue to use CNI for the knee sound. 
And then for nematocyst, it's N-E-M. Uh, I don't know why they couldn't just stick with N-E-I for the neat sound, but there you have it. We're always making things complicated as biologists. So the nidocyte is this entire cell, the entire stinging cell. Um, they have a little trigger here called the nidocell, and this is normally what will cause um, the nematocyst to discharge. So sometimes nidarians, they have a, a trigger, and sometimes they're opened up um, due to pressure differences um, within the cell, between, between the inside and the outside of the cell. So inside, what you're seeing here is a coiled nematocyst, so an undischarged nematocyst. And once that nidocell has been triggered, then the nematocyst um, pops open, and it's basically a type of harpoon, or that's one way you can think of it. It's a kind of harpoon. They often have barbs at the base. Um, this is what's referred to as the filament, and many of them have toxins that can be associated with them, so not only can they hurt uh, the animal that um, is punctured with them, but they can be quite toxic and very painful because of the toxins that can be released. And then what happens is after they've used, discharged these um, to either defend themselves or to grab, capture prey, these will actually be withdrawn and coiled back up and they'll close back up inside the neato site to be uh, used again. By the way, the cover on uh, these that holds them inside is called the operculum. So this is a diagram that shows you some of the different kind of shapes and sizes that those filaments um, and nematocysts come in. But there's a, a lot of variety and it varies from species to species. So one of the interesting aspects of radial symmetry is that the typical anatomical terms that you use either um, for bipedal organisms like yourself or quadrupedal organisms like your cat, um, they just don't apply to radially symmetric, symmetrical animals. So they don't have a head end or a hind end, so to speak. So the terms that need to be used uh, are different, and they um, revolve around the mouth and in the opposite side of the mouth. So if you're looking at this typical jellyfish form here, the mouth is on the underside of what's sometimes referred to as the bell. So that's the oral side. And then the opposite side would be referred to as the aboral side. Now what's interesting about nidarians is that sometimes uh, the mouth is always surrounded by tentacles, but those tentacles might be facing down or they might be facing up. But either way, the mouth is always going to be in the center of the tentacles. And it doesn't matter if the nidarian is facing up, if the mouth is facing up or if the mouth is facing down. Wherever the mouth is, that's the oral side, and the opposite side is always the ab-oral side. Also, what's important to note is the typical or classic life forms in the nidarians. So if you're a sort of jellyfish-looking um, life form, you're referred to as the medusa. And if you're more of the sessile, sort of non-moving, settled to the bottom <coughs> type of life form, you're referred to as a polyp. So again, remember that these guys are derived from ectoderm and endoderm. There's no mesoderm. And in most organisms, um, like mammals, your muscles are derived from mesodermal cells. And these guys have no mesoderm, so they don't have true muscle cells in that developmental sense. They do have some structures that approach that, and I'll show you those in just a minute. But it is important to know that the insides, so you can see the ectoderm on the outside here, um, here it's indicated in light blue and a little bit of light blue here on the outside. The inside that's sort of lined in red that they're trying to show you, that's the endoderm. And the yellow part on the inside, um, where, where the gastrovascular cavity uh, is formed and where digestion occurs in part, or initializes anyway, it's often filled with um, cells called mesoglia. So don't get these confused with mesodermal cells. They aren't mesodermal in origin. They're derived from the endoderm. Oh, so I've already explained the polyp and medusa, the life stages. Um, and then I've already pointed you to the gastrovascular cavity. So what will happen is that food items will be um, withdrawn into the gastrovascular cavity, and digestion will begin to occur in the cavity um, via enzymatic processes. And then some of those nutrients, as they're broken down, will be pulled into the, um, the cells of the lining the gastrovascular cavity, and they'll be further broken down and digested and absorbed um, by the nidarian. Now that said, notice that there's a mouth, but we don't have an anus yet. So when it comes to the breakdown products um, 
from that digestion uh, process, and by this I mean just the, the physical breakdown, if you have any waste products that would form solid waste, that's going to have to be expelled back out through the mouth. So they're going to have to release that waste that way. When it comes to metabolic waste, so what would be, say, urine in our case, that's going to have to be released um, by diffusion through the um, cell membrane or through vacuoles. Clearly, one hallmark of nidarians is that they have tentacles that are primarily used for feeding, but don't think that these function like hands and arms. They don't have the correct sorts of structures to be able to move in that way. Um, they can sometimes be coiled up towards the mouth, and then um, food can get in that way, um, but they don't actually place it in as um, distinctly as you would use a hand. So... While Nidarians do have primitive nervous systems um, and mu pre-muscular cells, um, they are quite simplistic. So they have these cells called epitheliomuscular cells, and you can see them indicated in pink in this diagram here and here. And notice that um, they, in this diagram, they have them going in two directions. So you can think of this as being up and down, and these cells are side to side. So these cells are capable of some sort of contractile um, movement. So they can shrink up and then loosen back up, shrink up and loosen back up. Um, and those are powered by their nerve net. So the nerve cells, you can see um, in part, they're sort of stylized here, but you can see them here in this sort of blue-gray color. So it's the nerve cells that are actually powering these epithelial muscular cells and causing them to contract. And when they do that, that's what gives, in the case of like jellyfish, that sort of classic, you know, movement as they're trying to go through the water, right? So they're kind of pumping as they move through the water. However, it's literally like a, it's almost like a shock. So it's a stimulus, um, a, a, an electrical current, and then it causes those muscles to contract. And they only have muscles going in a couple of different directions. So the, the movements that they can make are very limited. So they literally can only contract and basically cause water, in the case of jellyfish, to pump out the bell and, you know, project them forward and then, you know, contract and then relax, contract, relax, basically moving them forward. But most Nidarians really don't have a whole lot of um, ability to, to direct where they're moving. They're just moving. Um, so they're, they are quite limited in their uh, ability to move. Um... Let's review a few other kind of parts of Nidarians that you should know. Um, you don't need to know necessarily all of these, but some of them we've already covered. So you're aware of tentacles. We'll talk about different kinds of tentacles later, but sometimes you can have um, um, oral tentacles that are around the mouth, and sometimes you can have body tentacles that are outside the bell. Um, actually, I think pretty much all these structures we've already sort of covered. Let me show you this quick movie um, on polyps and medusas. Riveting. Okay. Um, we've already kind of covered that. Okay, one important aspect about uh, Nidarians is that they have what's termed a hydrostatic skeleton. So you may or may not be familiar with how muscles work, and we're not going to go into the gory details of actin and myosin and how they're powered. But what is important to note is that with muscles, you need to note they can only contract. Okay, they can't they can't push, they can only pull. So for instance, when you're withdrawing your hand you know, towards your body, you're contracting your biceps muscles and that's causing your forearm to move towards you. Um, but when you want to move your hand away from your body, what has to happen is those biceps have to relax and then your tricep muscles contract, so shorten up, and then that moves your arm down in a way. Well, in order for this to actually happen, right, you must have um, 
uh, a skeleton, right? Some sort of rigid structure that allows you to move um, your body parts, right? Well, these guys lack that. So they had these epithelial muscular cells. Hopefully that's going to go off in just a minute. You have epithelial muscular cells, um, but they don't have any kind of a skeletal structure to attach those muscles to to really direct their movements. But, but they need to attach to something so that they can actually contract. <coughs> so what they do is you can think of their bodies as being fluid-filled balloons. And so because they're, those fluid-filled balloons have a, um, a sort of water pressure um, inside them, the muscles can then attach to the sides of the balloon and for, have a little bit of structure to, to contract against. And then when they contract against that hydrostatic skeleton, that allows them to contract their whole body. And in this case, in the case of jellyfish, you can actually pump water out of the bell and then move. So the hydrostatic skeleton is um, a proxy for having a real rigid skeleton like bones, um, so an internal skeleton, or even an external skeleton for that matter. But it's not as efficient as having a true rigid skeleton. So it's an advancement over not having a skeleton, not quite as good as having a true skeleton. We've already talked about, oh, something I forgot to mention. So when it comes to that nerve net, um, so they do have nervous cells, or at least the precursors to nervous cells, but the, the cells that Nidarians have are really unusual. So there is a network of them all over the body. Um, they don't form um, uh, distinct... Uh, radiating um, connected uh, lines of cells like your nervous system has, okay? They just have cells that are kind of all over the body that uh, produce an electrical current. And unlike nerve cells in humans, um, where current can only go in one direction, their nerve cells, their current can go, it's bipolar, so it can go in either direction. So it can go, if you will, forward and backward. Um, and us, it doesn't work that way. I took this off of your um, worksheet, but just briefly, just so you know, some Nidarians have um, all these different kinds of polyp forms um, uh, within an individual. So it's sort of like a colonial structure. Um, gastrozooids are these tentacles that are feeding tentacles, so gastro meaning your food, so your stomach. Um, gonozooids are the reproductive um, polyps. And so there, here's a female one, and here's a male one, although I've got to say this picture leaves a lot to be desired in terms of explaining what's going on. Dactylozoids um, are, dacty refers to hands, um, but in this case they actually refer to the defensive polyps. So these are the stinging um, or, or even grasping um, polyps uh, to grab food. And then the spines are you know, exactly what they sound like. It's a, there's no illusion there, so it's a, it's a, it's a spine. And so there are certain kinds of Nidarians that are actually quite complex forms. They're colonial forms of polyps. Um, and you see this kind of thing on uh, Portuguese Man of War, which we'll talk about in a moment. Okay, this is the phylogeny from your book, but we're going to try to trim this down a little bit. Um, so these are the four classes that we're going to cover. The Anthozoa, Cyphozoa, Cubozoa, Hydrozoa. So we're going to skip the Starozoa. And we're going to simplify the hydrozoa. We're going to get rid of some of these branches. And I'm going to show it to you like this, but I want you to know that even though there's a lot of variation in the forms in the hydrozoa, we really just don't understand their relationships very well. And so I'm going to treat this like a single branch. So for right now, I'm going to get rid of the man of war. So for simplicity, we're going to have four branches as you see them here. And what's really important to note is that the first split in the phylogeny is with the anthozoa versus everyone else. And then you have a split between hydrozoa and the other two. And these two sister taxa are the cyphozoa and the cubozoa. So you need to be able to um, commit this tree to memory, be able to redraw it, um, and know how who, who's on which branch. So the anthozoa are the sea anemones and corals. The cyphozoa are the typical sort of jellyfish um, that most people are familiar with, bell-shaped. The cubozoa, their sister taxon, is um, the box jellies or cube-shaped uh, jellies. And then the hydrozoa, which is kind of a garbage can group, there's all kinds of Nidarians in this group and we're still trying to untangle their relationships. They are loosely just referred to as hydras. PhD waiting for you if you want to go study these things, by the way.
Okay, before we go into each of the classes, let's talk a little bit more about general characteristics and life cycles. So we're going to talk about life cycles a lot throughout the semester. Um, typically with us, when we think of life cycles, it's simply, you know, birth, maturation, reproduction, and death. Uh, that's true for a lot of animals, but there are specifics that are unique to each uh, group of animals that we're going to be covering. So the sort of stylized Nidarian life cycle that I'm showing you here is for a, um, uh, the genus Obelia. And we're going to begin this life cycle at the polyp stage. Now this particular Nidarian, Obelia, alternates between polyp and medusa stages. So in this case, you have the polyp stage. Here's a colony of polyps. And you have two major structures you should be familiar with here. Hydrants are the structures that are used for feeding. And gonangium, uh, that's the singular, gonangia is the plural. So these are the reproductive parts. Generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking with Nidarians, if you are a polyp life form, and you're going to reproduce yourself, you do it asexually. If you are a Medusa life form, you generally tend to reproduce sexually. There are exceptions to the rule, but that's generally the way it works. So what you have inside this gonangium are these little Medusa buds. So they are being reproduced asexually. And they come out the gonopore, and here you go, the world's cutest little bitty jellyfish right there. So when those are released into the water column, um, they will grow and mature and become reper reproductive adults. And in this case, what you're seeing with Obelia is um, a diaceous life form. So you have males and females that are separate from each other. When they want to reproduce sexually, they release eggs and sperm into the water column. They unite to form a zygote and begin dividing. Then you get the blastula. We're not going to go through all the different life stages, but ultimately you develop into a larval form. And this is a free swimming larval form. It's covered by cilia. Once it has grown big enough and reached a particular life stage, it will then begin to settle down onto the ocean floor and will form a polyp um, shape. And then it will grow and divide and form a colony, just like you see here. And then the life cycle is complete. So this is sort of a classic example of the life cycle, but you're going to find that in each class, the life cycles vary a, a fair bit. A couple other structures you should be familiar with. So even though um, Nidarians have a very simplified nervous system, they do need to interact with their environment. And so they have structures called statocysts, which allow them to um, uh, sense gravity. So when they're um, basically upside down or right side up. These statocysts are indicated in this particular picture in between these tentacles as little black dots around the rim of the bell. This particular individual doesn't have this second structure, but some Nidarians do. And those are called ropalium for singular, ropalia for plural. But these are structures that allow them to sense light as well as gravity. And so it's important for some of their um, life processes to know when the sun is up or the sun is down and to know whether they're facing right side up or right side down. Although sometimes when you see them in the water column, it doesn't seem to matter. They're just flowing with the current. And sometimes they're upside down and sideways and it doesn't seem to bother them. Other structures you should know, so usually the if you're in a Medusa life form, this is called the bell, and there's the X umbrella, which is the outside of the bell, and the sub umbrella, which is the inside. Here's the mouth, and you have a sense of these um, very small tentacles associated. They're not true tentacles, but they're referred to as oral lobes. But depending on the species you're looking at, there might be some really prominent um, oral tentacles. Um, the manubrium is basically the neck that kind of leads from the mouth up into the gastrovascular cavity up here. You can see the gonads here, uh, and often they're very prominently viewed through um, the X umbrella towards the inside. Um, this particular um, diagram is showing you what's called the vellum. So it's sort of this flap uh, on the edge of the bell, but on the inside of the organism. And so depending on the species or class you're talking about, this is a very important structure. And what it does is it allows um, the, the individuals to have more back pressure when they're, when they're constricting. So when water flows out, it has more force and it pushes them, them forward um, uh, more forcefully. Um, you can kind of get a sense of this um, if you want to go uh, do an experiment. You can go get a big mouthful of water, leave your mouth wide open and try to spit it out and then go get another mouthful of water and then close it open to a small hole and then spit it out. 
And I think you'll find that the force from your mouth closed up is way more intense than if you left your mouth way open, aside from being hilarious to do, probably in front of friends. Okay, what else? Actually, those are the major structures that you're seeing here. We're not going to talk about um, some of these um, other forms. Okay, so let's review how they get it done before we talk about the four different classes. So we've already covered digestion. So they have tentacles to try to capture prey with, and they probably use their pneumaticists to try to um, uh, gather those prey up. Um, they then bring those prey items into the gastrovascular cavity where you have extra and intracellular breakdown and processing. Um, oh, you're going to see this in labs. So you're going to have hydra, and you might be able to feed them uh, daphnia. And I'll show you a video of this later. It's super cool. Um, i got to say, this is a pretty fun thing to watch. In terms of the ex uh, excretory system, remember, they do not have an anus, so they're going to have to get rid of their solid waste um, out their mouths, so they expel it. And then in terms of metabolic waste, they're going to do that through vacuoles or diffusion through the membrane. Uh, in terms of locomotion, uh, hopefully you'll be able to describe the relative motion that they do when they're uh, a medusa life form. When they're a polyp life form, they really don't move much, maybe side to side, moving their tentacles and whatnot, but they're pretty sessile. There's a jellyfish. Uh, in terms of the nervous system, we didn't go into gory details, but they have a nerve net. The nerve current actually can flow bidirectionally on the axons. Um, I say there's no sheathing here, but don't worry about that. Um, they do have sense organs, so you should know about the statocyst and the ropalia. In terms of respiration osmoregulation, this is still done via um, diffusion and with vacuoles. So they don't have um, a respiratory system per se, and, and they um, are osmoregulating in a very um, primitive fashion. They don't have a circulatory system. And we covered re reproduction in part in terms of reproducing sexually or asexually, but we're going to talk about the asexual reproduction a bit more in just a minute. So here's the phylogeny that I showed you. Let's go into each of the groups, and we'll start at the base of the tree with the anthozoa. So these are the uh, sea anemones and corals. Um, they have a. They often look something like this. At least the sea anemones do, and the corals, as it turns out, look very much like this if you look at them up close. So you have tentacles that are surrounding a mouth, which um, descends down into the gastrovascular cavity. Um, they have retractor muscles, so they can kind of scrunch up a little bit, but they really don't move much. It's primarily a polyp form rather than a medusal form. You're going to look at these in lab and learn more about the structures. Um, but you can see the gonads in here. These are yellow. And there are these structures called achontia that are used for defense. And they can shoot these up um, through the, the pharynx and out the mouth, and they can um, use them as harpoons to harpoon prey or to defend themselves. And very, they can be very painful. They have um, segments of their body that they're separated by septa. So if you cut a sea anemone through at uh, this where this white line is and take a look. Oh, sorry, they're all polyps, no say They can be solitary or colonial. They're all marine. Uh, I'm going to tell you about unique forms and structures in just a minute. So. If you cut them and look at them, um, this is uh, their part of their mouth structure. And then what's referred to as the saphonic lips are here in the sides. It's almost like they can purse their lips on the side to increase or decrease the size of this hole and to uh, affect the water pressure coming in and out. Here you can see these septal um, separations here. So it's called a complete septum if it goes from the outside to the mouth or the pharynx structure of the um, individual. You have secondary septa and then tertiary septa. And what these do is allow for more um, surface area for digestion of whatever animal it is that they're consuming. And there are also these holes, these perforations between the septa that allows for water flow um, with, within the uh, anemone and then down you know, within this compartment and then up through the pharynx. And the reason that they have these water columns is, remember, these guys, they're going to have to um, um, eliminate their waste through their mouth, uh, both solid as well as metabolic waste. And so they need a water current to be established to carry those um, 
uh, items away. So some of these are diaceous, so they have separate sexes. Some of them are monaceous, they have both male and female reproductive parts on them. And for commensals, this is uh, again a familiar story, but let's review. I don't know how that got to that video, but anyway, so you understand about the anemones and um, clownfish. Okay, so um, these guys in the class, class Anthozoa, they can reproduce asexually via uh, a process called petal laceration. So this bottom part of their bodies right here is referred to as the petal disc. You can think of it as being like a foot. And so if they were to get part of this cut and it was to come off, let's say maybe a predator was trying to come in or maybe a rock fell on it or anyway, if part of it breaks off, that part that breaks off can actually um, uh, continue to grow and form a complete new individual and repair itself. And so it can literally reproduce by having hunks of it um, being taken off the original parent individual. And where the bit has come off the parent individual, that will heal itself and it will completely regrow and it will it will um, heal from the injury. They can also reproduce asexually via what's called transverse fission. So they can literally um, uh, divide in half and form two complete individuals. And sorry, I think I did that in the wrong fashion. It should be transverse. It should be this way. Now this is um, a stylized picture of a coral. So what you can see is that corals are basically sea anemones that happen to uh, exude a, a calcium carbonate calcium carbonate skeleton. And so you can see it. Here's a typical sea anemone. It just happens to be sitting in this base that it actually um, exudes season after season. It has all the same major structures. Okay, the second group that we're going to cover are the cubozoa. So yes, we're going to come back to the cyphozoa in just a minute. Cubozoas are cube-shaped. They're very simple, sort of box-shaped jellies, and they're referred to as box jellies. They have tentacles on each of the four corners on the base of the bell. They are pre predominantly a medusan form. Um, the polyp is, depending on which species you're talking about, it's either inconspicuous, it forms a really small part or short part of the life cycle, or it's unknown. So a PhD waiting for you to study that. Here's a sort of um, stylized picture, and you can see the four tentacles coming down. You can see it's sort of squarish, boxy shaped um, here, but otherwise it has all the same basic structures of any typical jellyfish. You can see the mouth, the manubrium, the gastric filaments. Um, notice that it does have a, um, a vellum on the inside. So these guys are voracious predators, primarily a fish, but the toxins from their tentacles are in, from their nematocysts is extremely painful and extremely powerful. And these are known, so these guys are only known from um, around Australia and sort of Southeast Asia, and so it's a very narrow range, but they can be incredibly um, painful if encountered, uh, if humans encounter them. So you wanna be really careful wherever box jellies um, are present. The class Cyphozoa, so sister to the Cubozoa, um, are primarily medusan forms, but they lack the vellum on the inside of their bells, um, unlike the Cubozoans. They tend to be dioecious, um, so they have separate sexes, and the gonad gonads are usually very obvious in their gastric pouches, and you'll see another picture in just a moment. 
they have internal fertilization. Um, and so what happens is uh, the males will release sperm into the water column. The females will take them up, fertilize their eggs. And the eggs are actually held on these oral arms that you see here on the underside of the bell until they reach a particular size and stage and then they're released into the water column. And so just to give you a glimpse into one of the species, um, so here's the, the bell, or the typical medusin form. And so usually when they're in the medusin form, they reproduce sexually. And so males and females um, uh, come together. The males release sperm. Uh, the females hold them um, and fertilize their eggs and hold the, um, the larvae on their um, oral arms. Eventually, they will form these um, planula larvae that will then now this is kind of an odd way that they depict this, so they, they don't actually go into a cave and stick to the roof of the cave. This is supposed to be the ground here, but this is just the way that they drew it. Anyway, it settles to the ground, forms this polyp um, part of the life cycle, which is called a cyphostoma. It begins to grow, and these can actually reproduce um, just more polyps by budding or fission. But then what it'll do is it'll asexually produce these little layers. So these are actually individual um, individuals of the species that are referred to as strobola. And then basically they're little bitty medusas. And once they mature to a particular stage, they'll be released into the water column. They'll go through a sort of juvenile or teenage stage called the, called the ephyras until they become larger and form reproductive adults. To me, these things look like those uh, really... Um, bad plastic ashtrays that you see in dive bars. That's what they look like to me. So, sexual reproduction when they're medusa, asexual reproduction when they're polyp form. Okay, and then the hydrozoa, as I mentioned earlier, this is a kind of a garbage can group. We don't fully understand the relationships among the uh, different species that have been classified in the hydrozoa. There are lots of different life forms. Um, so some have no medusae, some have, do have medusae, some are only medusae, so it's kind of anything goes in this group at the moment. And they can reproduce sexually or asexually, and they also include colonial forms like the Portuguese man of war. Um, so let me show you a video of this hydra feeding, which hopefully you'll get to do in lab. So this is through the view of a, of a microscope because they're quite small. And what you just saw was, um, actually, I think that's some sort of shrimp. But anyway, so it's already captured two of them. Nom, 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 nom. And watch as it keeps going. I think it's some kind of crustacean. It looks like a shrimp or something. Oh, now it's got a third one. This guy is hungry. Huh? I was thinking it was going to get a fourth one. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, that's it. Anyway, so you get the picture. So that was a hungry, hungry, hungry hydra. Oops. Okay, we're not going to go over this particular life cycle, but what I do want to make note of are these Portuguese man of war. So these are colonial um, organisms where they have the medusal form here that's literally like a balloon. And then there are these tentacles descending down. But if you look on the underside, there are a number of different polyp colonies that are actually living under there. So there's feeding colonies, there's reproducing colonies, defensive colonies. They're all under there. And they're all living together in this um, colonial fashion and floating around the ocean, uh, the ocean environments. So don't forget this phylogeny. We're going to start practicing this soon where you're going to be able to draw, freehand draw this whole thing. But let me walk you through it um, as we walk up, work up through our phylogeny. So we did the protozoans first, then the peripherans, and then the nidarians. So I'm going to highlight these. Um, oh, yes. So here we have, oh, it's kind of hard to see, but here's the eukarya. Here's kingdom animalia. Remember, so the protozoans are, uh, are not true animals. Here's the animalia. And we have the first split is, sorry, is here between the parazoa, these are the peripherans, 
and everything else, which are referred to as the Eumetazoa, and they're distinct, the distinguishes, uh, among other things, is developing from true germ layers. True, not too true. The next split is here between the Nidaria, which is also referred to, along with all of its relatives, as the radiata, so things that are radially symmetric, radially symmetrical organisms, diploblastic, radially symmetric, versus everything else over here, which is, oh, oh, uh, which is going to be, I guess I'll tell you about it in the next one, this is the bilateria. Everything else is bilaterally symmetric, and we'll talk about why that's important. Um, I'm just going to leave you with this picture. I'll show you this movie in class, and that's all I have to say about that. We'll talk more in class. Enjoy.